So I will start this by saying because of the time limit and because of what I'm trying to get through, I'm happy to take questions at the end, but I'm just going to kind of push through all of this. And I always want to make the point that I believe that we read paintings left to right because of the way we read. So Western paintings um, in particular. And then I would have you note that with Rembrandt, if you look at these kind of from a distance, you'll see a spotlight. I mean, there's light in the centers of those. So he's, you know, setting up what is the most important element, and we'll be talking about that as we move through these. But then also know that he is also uh, designing, devising his imagery on a left to right basis in many cases. And I will start off by saying that this, this selection was really a God's moment because um, Leanne and I were communicating. She had asked me if I would be willing to do a couple of Sunday school uh, uh, presentations. And I had been thinking about it, I, and I wasn't quite sure what I would be doing. And I was in Munich in November uh, visiting my grandson. And um, I was with our oldest son, Ryson. And we were actually in the Alta Pinacoteca, uh, the, the major museum in Munich. And I got a text from Leanne, and um, it, she said, Yes, you're on, it's March, and we were standing here looking at these paintings. <laughs> and I'm like, this is it, <laughs> this is what I'm doing. Um, so that was a really, I don't know, it was a really moving moment for me. I was like, Ryson, this is it, this is it. Um, so I had Ryson take this picture of all of them. So these are the five paintings that we'll be looking at. Actually, there's a little, uh, there are three others that are kind of peripherally rate related to the series, and I'll be walking through these. Um, I want to point out that these are, um, they're roughly three feet high by 28 inches wide, so not huge paintings. And the trick is, when you're in the museum, they have laser sensors set up, you know, so that you can't get too close. And so we were looking at them and trying to see them, but they're hung a little high for me <laughs> and so we're trying to see them in great detail. I figured I'd come home and be able to find good uh, you know depictions on the internet now. That's not always the case. So some of this um, kind of you know we're, we're trying to work through as we're looking at it. The other thing I want to point out as we're um, looking at this slide is you can see up here at the top, there's an enormous frame running along that. That is probably a Rubens painting, which is hung above, you know, so it, it was a very tall gallery. It's a very large painting. Um, and that will become, um, it, it's relevant because I'm going to be doing a lot of contrast between Rembrandt and um, Peter Paul Rubens. And Rubens's name is on your your sheet. So I tried to provide you with um, the main names and their dates that of the people that I'll be talking about. But these smaller paintings that Rembrandt was doing, um, generally outside of a museum setting, <laughs> would invite close um, observation and you know close. Uh, close inspection so that, you know, for his patron, for the people at the time, they would have been able to see more, most clearly, what was um, placed in those paintings and how it all worked together. So, as you might have noticed, that there were five in what is considered to be his passion series. The first one is this, the raising of the cross. Uh, this was painted uh, between 1632 and 1633. 
Uh, at the time, uh, Rembrandt was a 26-year-old artist born in 1606. Is that right? Do I remember that? Thank you. I have to check with my numbers guy. Uh, <laughs> uh, so it was this one and the next one, the Descent from the Cross, that were the original two paintings in the commission that Rembrandt received. And you'll see in the center that Christ is there. He's nailed to the cross. The cross is being pushed into position. Um, it was, there's a hole that was dug it, um, below it so that it's fitting into that hole. And you might see there, can you see the spade that's set there, you know, to, to demonstrate that they had to dig this hole to put the, the long beam of the cross into it. And then you'll see that there are, well, maybe you can't see exactly clearly, but there are, there are five uh, men who are working to push the cross into that upright position. So in the front, there's a Roman soldier wearing a helmet and a cuirass um, so that the light is kind of sparkling off those metal details. And then there's an individual in um, the blue beret and the blue um, tunic who's kind of standing at the side and he has one hand um, placed on the, the bottom of the cross below the Roman soldier. And then there are three individuals who are very difficult to make out, uh, quite honestly, on the back side who are pushing against the cross. So there's a real element of the physical nature of this. And one of the things Rembrandt is trying to um, convey is that this was an actual historical event. And this took a uh, real effort by the Romans, by the, um, yeah, by the Roman um, society to, uh, to raise this cross, to uh, create this level of uh, agony and torture for an individual. On uh, the <clears throat> individual there with the turban, is um, he's on horseback. Maybe you can see the horse's neck kind of uh, behind um, Christ's figure there. And he's the Roman commander. It might be, you might, you know, if you're sitting back further, it might be easier to see on your um, handouts too. Uh, we tried to could you copy? Even though you don't have a laser pointer, could you, you could walk over and point it out? That might be helpful. Yeah, I'm always afraid I'm going to trip over the cross. <laughs> so here's the turbaned individual, and then the horse here, and the end of the horse. Here's the Roman soldier who is, he's actually pushing um, with his feet on the cross to pull it into position. And then there's a group of men here on this area. And back in that, um, behind, there are um, the other two thieves are being led off to their crosses. So it's, <clears throat> you could see the, um, the fact that, you know, that historical aspect of the, the whole scene is happening, but Rembrandt is focusing only on the uh, crucifixion of Christ. So the group of elderly men in this foreground here, thank you, maybe this will help you all see better. Is that helping? Yeah. Um, so they're elderly men, they're generally taken, thank you, Dan taken to be the synagogue elders who are coming to mock um, Christ and to, you know, so they're utilizing different facial expressions and gestures to point out that this man who had the hubris to um, claim that he was the son of God is actually being 
crucified as a common criminal. So the next painting in the series is the descent from the cross. And here, again, you can see that Rembrandt has really focused the light on the central figure of the now dead Christ, who you know, is slumping his body, is really kind of ungainly and uh, rather, um, well, unattractive as, as opposed to the more tense figure that he was showing in the, the raising. And you can see that he's placed a, a white cloth behind Christ. So you have some um, contrast between the whiteness of Christ's body and that even whiter cloth that acts as the shroud then for his burial. And there are uh, numerous individuals who are working to, you know, release him from the agonies of his death on the cross. There's the individual at the top, and then there are um, two kind of three men on ladders who are, you know, working to do that. Um, and the men underneath who are receiving the body as it's coming down with uh, the shroud between their hands and his body. And then there's a group back here again on the um, left side, um, a couple of men who now appear to be the disciples. They're kind of turning to each other in disbelief and in sorrow with different gestures in their hands to convey different um, emotions, uh, wringing hands, hands open in disbelief. The group down here, there's a group of the three women. Um, and for this purpose is because the Marys show up to distinguish, I'm going to call Jesus' mother the Virgin. Um, so it's the Virgin and the Marys. Um, I know it sounds like a fairly Catholic term. We don't use that very much in the Protestant, but it makes it a lot easier for her um, to, to distinguish. So they're, you know, kind of huddled down here. The Virgin has kind of swooned in her sorrow, and the other Marys are supporting her. And then there's an individual there in the front with the turban, who's looking toward Christ, who's watching um, the, his descent from the cross. And that's generally taken to be um, Joseph of Arimathea, who had you know, volunteered to take his body. <clears throat> and then in the background, there's kind of a landscape on the left and on the right, you, um, buildings and um, architectural details, which is taken to be the city of Jerusalem. The third painting, and I do not think that this is, um, well, this is not the exact coloring, but to get the one with the rounded arch, um, this is what I had to go with. So um, it's a little more golden, I think, than what it actually is. And in this, he's depicted the scene inside kind of a larger tomb. So we're inside the sepulcher. You can see the opening there in the background. And in the background, you can see um, the, the crosses still on the hillside. And there are little figures back there. So, you know, it's clear that we've moved away from um, Golgotha and moved into the tomb. And Christ is there again in the center. Um, he's uh, limp in death and he's being cradled again by that sheet, that shroud that's still being utilized to convey his body into the tomb. Um, <clears throat> and there's a spade there again in the front so that you know that they had to work to prepare um, some kind of place for him. 
there is an individual behind his body over here who's holding a candle to provide some of that interior illumination. And then there's a lantern on the other side um, that helps kind of provide light on the other side. And the Virgin is here at the foot of uh, Christ's body. And interestingly enough, she is turned away from this scene. Um, common depictions usually have her focused on that, you know, still um, absorbing the horror of the afternoon's events. Um, so it's interesting that she's turned here. And then there are two other Marys there in the darkness with her. And there's some figures also in the background who are taken to be the other disciples. There are curtains here. There's a curtain here and a curtain on that other side. And I just point those out. We're not, I don't know, scholars aren't quite sure what to make of that, except it kind of provides a setting, a little sense of privacy in this um, inside of this vast or larger space anyway, but they do show up in the next um, image, which is this. This is the uh, entitled The Resurrection, and here the curtain is on the um, far right side, kind of behind um, what is the figure of Christ as he's coming out of the tomb. But you see that in the center of this painting, the angel has descended, has entered this sepulchral space, and you know the, the light is there behind that. A very substantial angel with that very large wing spread, and the angel is actually um, pulling up the lid of the tomb. And then you can see that Christ is emerging there on the far right. And interestingly, he's still wrapped in the shroud. It's kind of hard to see that. Um, but there's, there's a cloth that's um, kind of still over him. So he's still in the, you know, the process, I guess, of, uh, you know, fully emerging. And um, there are a series of guards here in the front. Um, there are stairs, which I can't make out. I just had to read that. Um, but there are Roman soldiers there in, you know, wearing their um, metal armor pieces. And they're all, you know, in different kind of poses as they're responding to this miraculous event. And one of them is um, dropping his sword and then that sword so the sword is here and it points to this group down here which are um, the Marys again so there are two of them um, one presumed to be Mary Magdalene and then the other Mary um, and there one of them is raising her hands in disbelief and the other one was apparently holding uh, an ointment jar, which she has dropped. So, you know, they were returning to um, anoint Christ's body and instead um, came upon this, the scene. And the, the um, reactions of the soldiers, you know, really provide an element of drama um, that's <clears throat> overscored, I guess, by the drama of the angel penetrating that the darkness of the death. And then the final scene in this series is the ascension. And this was uh, the third, actually, so he didn't, remember, it didn't paint these chronologically as I'm going through them. He, this was actually the third painting that he created, and it was not well received at the time. So it was interesting that despite that, then they still continued with the other two scenes. Um, and it's not clear why it wasn't well received, because uh, 
uh, it seems to fit well with the series. And um, but this is, of course, depicting the event that occurred 40 days after Christ's resurrection. And you see that he is there. He is standing um, on a little cloud, which is supported by a bevy of cherubim. And, you know, one is supporting it on his back. Several others are kind of uplifting it. And he, Christ's, you know, hands are outraged upraised and you can see the marks of the nails on his palms and he's ascending and above him is the dove of the Holy Spirit and um, there are stars there are stars creating a little halo up in up in here so some of that light is um, you know the rays are coming down from those stars that are up there and then down in the in the bottom um, to the right are the 11 disciples, and they are all exhibiting different facial expressions, different gestures as they're uh, taking or they're witnessing this uh, miraculous event. So those are the five paintings that I'll be primarily focusing on. And today um, we'll be kind of providing you with an overview. And then the next two weeks, we'll be looking more at the context of those paintings. So the paintings were created for this gentleman here, um, Frederick Henrik, who was the Stadthouder of the Netherlands, which means he was the um, Stadthouder. He's kind of the, the leader, the military leader of the Netherlands, because at this point, the, the Northern Netherlands, which we call the Netherlands today, and what is now Belgium, had separated. They had originally been controlled by the Spanish monarchy. And a little prior to this time, there had been um, wars that were only settled in 1648 to create that separation. So he was the leader, the, the, as close to the, at that point, as close to the um, royalty as the Dutch had. Um, and this was a painting that was done uh, of him by one of the leading portrait painters of um, the early, <coughs> um, early 17th century. So it was dated 1631, and you can see that he's, it's a profile painting, and he, uh, he was, he's shown in his military garb to make it clear that he's a strong leader. The portrait of his wife, Amalia van Som, was actually given, the commission was given, to Rembrandt. So Rembrandt had begun his career in Leiden and was moving to Amsterdam and establishing a name for himself. So the fact that he was given the wife's portrait commission was a major coup for him. And uh, you can see why Rembrandt maybe was chosen. I mean, if you look at that, um, the details on her lace collar and the intricacy and, you know, the, the differentiation on her hair and the glints of her pearls, and, you know, her earring and the rings of pearls around her hair that he was uh, making a claim. And it's hard to tell, again, with the the coloration here, but she's set in the same kind of oval that Frederick is, so it was a, a good matching pair. Um, and they're, they're engaged looking at each other. So, as I said, at this point he's 26, which is, you know, a major accomplishment that he has risen to um, the notice of the, the ruler of the Netherlands. But in fact, 
his paintings were becoming so well regarded that in a diplomatic exchange with um, the King of England, one of Rembrandt's paintings was sent as a goodwill gesture. So again, he was, um, he was well placed and well regarded. So this is the Binnenhof in The Hague, and this was the resident, the, the official residence of Frederick and Amalia. And um, it is set sort of on a lake, and um, it is currently under uh, renovation, so you can't get in. But there was a long gallery in this, um, as part of the actual residence. So it also houses the government um, offices or housed them in the 17th century. Um, but there was a long gallery that was kind of a intermediary space between their private residence and the official um, workings of the, the court. Um, and that's where Rembrandt's paintings were intended to be hung and were hung. Um, but Rembrandt was very, always very interested in how that space was working and was very, he apparently went and visited the space to make sure that the paintings were hung well and were, you know, easily viewable. And easily viewable in the sense that you needed to be able to get up close to them and you needed to be able to um, see the details in them. So, uh, this is a portrait of Constantine Hawkins, who was, um, and it dates from 1641, so a little later than what we're talking, but Hawkins was the private secretary for Frederick Henry. And he was actually um, very influential in this commission and in these, you know, in the creation of these paintings, and actually in the reputation of Rembrandt as he was starting out as a young, uh, young artist. So he served the role of the fiscal intermediary, and he served sort of as the first line patron. So Rembrandt was communicating with him. And in fact, there are surviving seven letters by Rembrandt that were sent to Christian How or Constantine Hawkins, and a son named Christian, um, Constantine Hawkins. So we have Rembrandt's part of that correspondence. And we know that you know, Rembrandt was concerned about the location of the paintings. He was also lobbying pretty hard for raises for each of the subsequent painting, the, the prices. Um, and as I said, Hawkins wrote about Rembrandt, and I'll bring that up later, um, but that helped cement Rembrandt's reputation. And then on the other side um, is a early portrait of Rembrandt, self-portrait of Rembrandt. So you can see um, how he, he visualized himself. He usually has kind of a largish nose. He often wears a beret in many of his self-portraits. And um, as a, if you're doing a self-portrait, you generally are looking in a mirror. So you're looking at, you know, looking out at the viewer. So he's pretty much a direct gaze there. And he's showing himself with, um, fairly nice uh, fabrics, and so you know that he's, he's making the claim anyway at this point in 1630 that he's doing pretty well and um, is somebody to be taken um, seriously, I guess. So a little bit of a switch here. <clears throat> so this series is a, a series of the passion of Christ. And just to make clear, um, Frederick Henry, as the leader of the Netherlands, at this point is a Protestant leader. One of the things um, that 
outfalls of that separ separation was because they were um, following or choosing a different path in the, the Christian um, life. And so the Belgium remained Catholic. Um, the Netherlands, as we know it today, became a Protestant community. Uh, but interestingly, um, they were a very uh, receptive and very tolerant um, community. And so they um, respected Catholics. There were a few, I mean, all of the Catholic churches in the Netherlands became Protestant um, when that divide happened. But there were, um, there was a, um, a hidden Catholic church. There were um, Jews who openly came to the to Amsterdam, and in fact, um, there were two groups of them. There were the Spanish Portuguese Jews, and then there were the German Russian Jews, and both of those built large synagogues right about this time period, well, a little later, but 16, or 1600s. Um, and both of those synagogues amazingly survived World War II. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, it was a, a fairly tolerant community. But Passions of Christ were kind of a uh, Catholic theme. So <clears throat> one of the earliest surviving ones is from, this is um, the uh, Scrovani Chapel in Padua, Italy. That's the exterior there. And then on the interior is uh, a whole thematic um, arrangement of the history of the Bible. Um, painted in about 1305, it's in fresco, so it's painted into the surface of the wall. It's a fabulous um, uh, venue. It's not very large. It may be about the size of um, this space, maybe a little larger, but you know, very, very small. It was intended as a family's private, private chapel. And it's telling the story of the um, redemption of humanity. So at the, on the top level, up here, are, is the story of uh, the Virgin, you know, her, her history. And then the middle level is the life of Christ, and the bottom level is the passion of Christ. And then that end wall is, um, you know, the, the final judgment. <clears throat> uh, so this is, and the passion of Christ along that bottom um, row is, uh, there are 11 scenes that relate to it. And um, so here are two that relate sort of to ours. Um, so you have the crucifixion of Christ, and Giotto was a very influential artist in the early 1300s and subsequently because he was uh, at the beginning of that um, realignment from kind of ethereal gold backgrounds, kind of otherworldly depictions of um, biblical scenes to more of a actual um, observation of the world around him and to actually uh, put more emotion into the depiction. So you see there with the crucifixion, if you look at the little angels, well actually the little cherubs in both of these paintings, you can see that they're um, in different, you know, flights, they're different, emoting different things, sorrow, grief, um, anguish and utilizing hand gestures to convey some of that. And, you know, you have the women here, this is the Virgin, and then the, the three Mary, well, this is John, sorry. Um, the two Marys here, the, <coughs> um, here over here you have the Romans and you can see that they've got Christ's robe and they're, you know, discussing how, what they're going to do with that. And then in the, in the lamentation, as it's generally called, um, 
the, the groups of individuals, um, again, displaying different kinds of emotion. Uh, that's John with his hands kind of um, back behind. Um, and here the Virgin is, you know, cradling Christ. But you have these figures here in the foreground with their backs on. We can't see who they are. And they're intended to uh, represent us, the viewer. You know, you're brought into that because you're um, looking into the scene like they are. Can we make a joke? The original emojis, right? <laughs> uh, I think those sort of characterized heads with the halo really yeah. captured the emoji. <laughs> so generally, scenes of the passion were localized. I mean, um, prior to the invention of printing in, you know, uh, I mean, think time of Columbus, kind of, um, you know, so 14, the late 1400s, um, individuals had to go to um, their church. They had to travel to another church to see different images. We're so, you know, immersed in all kinds of imagery now that wasn't available to people then. Uh, <clears throat> but with the invention of printing, then artists and um, individuals could commission works that would have multiple copies be made available. So then those multiple copies could be dispersed and something created in Italy could make its way to the Netherlands, um, something created in Germany. <clears throat> and these are two of the um, prints in a series that Albrecht Dürer did. Dürer was a German artist. He was probably a Protestant artist, but he was um, you know, kind of uh, back and forth on, um, depending on his patronage. But he created a series called the uh, Small, the Small Passion, uh, which um, includes. Sorry, uh, there are about thirty. There's thirty-six woodcuts in these um, in this series, and. They're fairly small. Um, but I did not write down the size. I apologize for that. But, you know, fairly small uh, images. And you can see on this one where <clears throat> Christ is being prepared on the cross. And, you know, it's interesting. His hand is draped here across his body, yet they're nailing the one hand on. Um, and preparing the placement for the other one, but haven't done it yet. And then in the other um, print, it's the descent from the cross. So he's being taken down. So again, these, these prints allowed for ideas to circulate uh, uh, throughout all of Europe. And then these are two um, depictions of the crucifixion. Here is an Italian one um, by an artist named Mantegna, and it dates from about 1459, and it's fairly small. It's 26 inches, 26 inches by 37. And the other one is a Flemish or a what we would think of as Belgium now, um, painting from 1495, uh, and it's 21 by 15. So both fairly small images. And um, you can see that here Christ is placed in the center. He's crucified in the manner that we uh, expect. And then you see that they've made the decision to show that the other 
thieves are crucified in a different manner so that they're not equal. They're not the same as Christ. And here in the Italian one, you can see he's got all of the parts of the biblical account. Here's John. Here's the virgin. Uh, she's, you know, collapsed in her grief, supported by the Marys. Here's the lance that is going, that pierces Christ's side. And over here are the Romans who are, again, um, gambling for his clothing. So it's set in an Italian setting. It's, you know, demonstrating how it relates to us. Um, you see here, there's a, there's a skull at the base of the cross, and that skull is generally included um, as a reference to Adam. So Adam, the first man, and Christ is um, the new Adam, and you know he's going to triumph um, where Adam, you know, started the downfall. And in the, um, it's a Harar David David crucifixion, and um, again, kind of a traditional display. Uh, in this one, in both of these paintings. Uh, it shows only three nails. Sometimes there are four, I believe in Rembrandt's. We'll see next week again. I think there are four nails to, for the crucifixion. But I chose this one because it shows Mary there in the front um, on the left side. And she's being supported by um, John. And this was um, kind of a fairly common um, theme to show Mary there at the, at the foot of the cross somehow um, in some way because again where um, Christ is seen as the new Adam, Mary was generally in the Catholic view seen as the new Eve. So you know she's there but that emphasizes the suffering that we had um, because as the mother, you know, who knew that this was a special child, but never fully comprehended, I think, you know, what, what this meant. Um, so it said it, it's quite traditional to um, include Mary and maybe, you know, apart from the women. And then again, I picked this one because there's a donor here. So the woman kneeling there in the green was probably the one who paid to have the painting uh, made. And, you know, she's, um, she's memorialized herself as a perpetual, you know, um, supplicant before Christ. So that's how these paintings often work. And then in the background is um, St. Jerome. And, you know, he was one of the church fathers and he, you know, would have been associated with this woman or her family because families often tied into saints as um, a specific individual. So in doing this, what I'm hoping that you've noticed is that there was no crucifixion in Rembrandt's series. <clears throat> because... Well, I don't know why the because is, but before he was given the commission for Frederick Henry to paint the five paintings that we were looking at at the beginning, apparently there was some kind of competition between he and um, kind of his contemporary to paint the crucifixion. So this is Rembrandt's here. It is four nails here. Um, <clears throat> and then the other painting is by um, Jan Levens, who was a year younger than Rembrandt. And they both started out as painters in Leiden, working with the same master. So they were both, um, you know, new, fresh, young painters 
looking for um, acceptance and patronage on the Netherlands art scene at the same time. And apparently, Constantine Halkins went to them and asked them for these paintings. So these both date from 1631. And what's interesting then is, you know, this determined that format for the other five paintings. It determined the coloration for those other paintings. And yet this one did not end up in the series. And in fact, it is in a church in France now. Um, so it apparently was not intended to be part of the series, but it was the <laughs> competition piece. And uh, Rembrandt was chosen as the winner of this competition. So he received the, the prestigious commission from Frederick Henry because of his painting. And <clears throat> what's interesting is this is where Constantine Hawkins comes into play then because he wrote in his autobiography in 1630 that he believed that despite their humble beginnings in Leiden, um, that Rembrandt and Jan Levens would surpass Rubens. And Rubens, as an aside, was the leading painter in Europe at that time. He was about 30 years older than these two, and he had worked at the court in Belgium, he had worked in the court in Spain and in England and in various courts in Italy. So he was the, uh, you know, the premier painter. And Constantine Hawkins wrote that he thought Rembrandt and Levens would surpass him. I would say that Levens did not. Um, and it depends, I think, on your aesthetic, whether you think Rembrandt or Rubens. Um, personally, I hold them both at the top. So they were given, um, you know, whatever instructions. They both painted them as, you know, single, solitary individuals. And I think in part, or primarily, that reflects um, that Protestant um, focus for these paintings that were not being distracted by the other um, individuals who were part of that. But it's intended to be um, a, a meditative, uh, interactive viewing of you know, Christ on the cross and how that impacted us, how that impacts us today even as individuals. So, Hawkins believed that Rembrandt was better, that he showed more emotion, more raw pain. He's um, depicting Christ as a, uh, you know, a, a body uh, that is kind of twisted and turned on the cross here. His mouth is open, his eyes are looking heavenward, but there's an element that he's kind of interacting with us, the viewer, too. And it, according to um, Hawkins, it was much more engaging than Levin's version, which seemed to him to be more elegant, but not as emotionally engaging. So I'll leave that up to you to um, determine. Um, and we'll pick up next week with more of a um, dive into the different paintings. So I'm happy to entertain any questions. Yeah, Paul. Do you think that it's so dark because of time and because of, you know, because obviously they're different in the way that they're done, but do you think it darkened up over time? Um, a little bit, but you know, they've gone back and restored them. I mean, there are I mean. extensive, um, you know, uh, run throughs of how, you know, they've been treated. None of these paintings are in great shape, which also, you know, muddies the water, so to speak, um, about how <clears throat> they're um, seen today. But 
one of the um, elements that Rembrandt prized and he was prized for was his careful attention to detail. And, you know, we know from the biblical account that the sky went dark and, you know, it, so that's part of this, you know, that he, um, we know that Rembrandt owned the Bible at this point, which, you know, would have um, not been common for many, um, and that he was actually, you know, utilizing that biblical text to inform, you know, instead of just going on tradition. So, you know, I think that is a large part of it. It's, it's him trying to be naturalistic and, and reflect. I mean, you know, when you see Christ, it, you know, that pale body against that dark background, I mean, that makes it more intimate, right? And it, it to me, it speaks more clearly, so, yes. Um, just ask a silly question, but is Rembrandt his first name or was it his uh -huh. Yes, his, his name is Rembrandt von Rhein, um, which at that point, many people didn't have necessarily last names. So von Rhein means from the Rhine area, and you know, he was born in Leiden along the Rhine River. So, <clears throat> um, you know, I mean, Rubens, Rubens is his last name. Yeah. Um, he's Peter Paul Rubens. And, um, but, you know, we generally, um, I guess, it, you know, the art historical convention is you just refer to the artist by a name. Uh, Michelangelo, that's his first name. Um, Raphael, that's his first name. Um, <clears throat> so it just depends. Anything else I can answer for you? Okay, well, thank you very much. Yes. Thank you.